Hey friends, it's Rick Miller, and this is... Xing the Gap. Drop in your nickel, folks, because the doctors are in. Today, I'm chatting with two prominent psychiatrists, Dr. David Goldblum and Dr. Javeria Zahir, who both have ties to Canada's East Coast, but now live and work in Toronto. David's the senior medical advisor at CAMH, the Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, an arts lover, educator, author, and officer of the Order of Canada. He also sits on so many boards it would get boring to list them all here. His colleague, Javeria, a geriatric millennial, her words, works as a clinician scientist and education administrator at CAMH and is an assistant professor at U of T's Department of Psychiatry. Together we riff on the Oregon Trail generation, people innovations in mental health, understanding the universe of others, the promise and peril of AI, social media avoidance and addiction, nature, nurture, and neuroplasticity, protecting the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and forgetting to put your pants on. In less than one second, that entirely social construct of embarrassment translates into an intense psychological and physiological experience. Five cents, please. Xing the gap. I have as my guests today, David Goldblum and Juveria Zahir. So welcome to you both. Great to be here, Rick. Thanks so much for having us on. David, you and I have known each other for about a decade through the Stratford Festival, first of all, through U of T, University of Toronto, where you've come to speak to my students in my architecture of creativity class. Uh, Juveria, we've just met, but from what I've read and heard, uh, you're just as impressive as Dr. Goldblum over here. And I wonder if you can each give me... (laughs) More so. We'll find out soon. Can you each give me just a, the, the little elevator pitch version of your story, who you are? David, I'll let you go first and then Juveria. So my name is David Goldblum, and I've been a psychiatrist for about 200 years at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health and a professor at the University of Toronto. And I'm uh, kept alive not simply by my work, but by a range of outside interests, principally in the arts. And you also play music, I should add. Yes, uh, badly at times, but I I play, uh, as my father would have said, largely for my own uh, amazement. <laughs> That's a good one. Javeria, over, over to you. I am also a psychiatrist at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health for slightly less time than Dr. Goldblum. Uh, like Dr. Goldblum, I am from the East Coast, uh, from Newfoundland, but grew up largely in Southern Ontario. Uh, and I think about why you become a psychiatrist. I love stories. I love to hear people's stories. I do a lot of storytelling and listening in my research, uh, which is largely focused on suicide and suicide prevention. So uh, it's great to be here and uh, excited to chat. Thanks, Javeria. And do you identify with the generational cohort? Are you a right in the heart of millennial age? That is a great question. Uh, I was born in 1982, which is almost a micro generation. So it's right between uh, Gen X and millennial. People call it the Oregon Trail generation, sort of three years, because people remember life before the internet and life after the internet. So it's a, I would say probably more of a millennial, um, an elderly millennial, a geriatric millennial, we'll say. And I'm, I'm, I'm a youthful collector of uh, old age pension. So you get a discount at uh, Shoppers Drug Mart? Every Tuesday. <laughs> okay, so we have a millennial or zennial or Oregon Trail. I've never heard that one, by the way. Thank you for educating me. I wanted to ask you, uh, David, your recent book, which was called We Can Do Better, Urgent Innovations to Improve Mental Health Access and Care. You write about how technological innovations can play a part, but it's actually innovations about people that are most urgently needed today. It made me think of Oliver Sacks, one of my favorite authors who used personal case studies to make neurological points in his books. My own boom trilogy of solo stage shows, I I choose to look at the big picture, history, politics, culture, always through personal stories. Can you tell me a little bit about how you view innovations about people and storytelling innovation in addition to science and technology as a way to make things better? Well, look, like Juveria, I think there is at the core of what we do as psychiatrists, that essential uh, human connection where one person understands the universe of another person or tries to. And 
nothing in technological advancement will erode that fundamental need and that fundamental role. However, we do know that in the same way that there are only you know, seven plots in all of fiction, uh, that the human stories are unique to the individual, but at a macro level, highly uh, repetitive. In fact, that's the only way we can understand people is by having some kind of template that allows us to make sense of what they're telling us. Well, if we can do that as humans, so can AI. And the role of artificial intelligence in understanding patterns of human behavior and of human experience has allowed for some degree of advance in models of understanding and indeed of helping people. It'll never, uh, I hope, at least in my lifetime, completely replace the human role, but as an adjunct and as a way of reaching more people, uh, disseminating things that we know help people, we are at our peril when we ignore it or dismiss it. Right. And Javeri, I wonder if I could throw it over to you with the added uh, quote from uh, Yuval Noah Harari, author of a lot of books right now, someone who's out there in many, many uh, spheres of public speaking, but he speaks of um, algorithms knowing us better than we know ourselves, certainly better than our moms know us and probably better than some of our therapists know us. So over to you, how do you feel about this idea of is it technology versus people or is it always an adjunct? When David was speaking, I very much agreed with what he said. One of the things I think about, though, is the only stories we know are stories we hear. And just reflecting on how multicultural our country is and how generationally diverse our country is, sometimes the worry can be if we only are familiar with certain stories without the, the dimensionality of culture and gender and gender diversity, sometimes that can be really challenging in and of itself. And when I think about AI, I think about the, you know, the rude way of saying it is garbage in and garbage out, but the maybe the better way of saying it is it's, it's an extension of ourselves and our humanity. And if we are potentially lacking that diversity and understanding people's experiences who may not look like us or who may not um, sit at the same tables, then those same difficulties are going to happen on the algorithmic side. Although I will say that I think sometimes algorithms and, and lots of data can actually prevent um, bias and difficulty because, you know, I could meet someone and I can make assumptions about who they are and what they look like. And if, but if I use an algorithm or if we collect algorithmic data, it almost is a, a way forward in terms of equity, right? Because we can say, let's make sure we don't just skim over this or think that this isn't relevant. So I think uh, the knife cuts both ways. And I think there's a lot to be excited about. Well, you can tell this is a Canadian podcast because you're going to have two guests in violent agreement. But, uh, <laughs> I really want to accentuate uh, Javeria's point that, yes, with algorithms, there's always the risk of a bias that is baked in by virtue of, let's say, saying that this is going to be a digital psychotherapy that makes you feel like a happier white male, right? Yeah. Now, obviously, that would appeal to me but not to everybody. And uh, we have to ensure, as Javeria said, that the technology that's built reflects us and reflects our needs uh, in a very 21st century way. Algorithms. The author Yuval Noah Harari often asks the question, what does it mean to live in a world in which increasingly we rely on the recommendations of algorithms? It sounds like a philosophical question, but it's very practical. We live in different realities now where we get different versions of the truth. Behind each of our black mirrors is an army of autocrats with algorithms who feed us propaganda, watch our every move, pull our strings and suck our data for profit. Is it The Matrix, The Truman Show, Brave New World or 1984? I don't know. But what I do know is that many of us seem trapped in vicious cycles of mis- and disinformation, echo chambers that lead to violent, antisocial behavior that one might clinically call psychopathic. Here's my question to you, Javeria. For a guy who wants to bridge gaps in our society, what can you tell me from a psychiatric perspective? How does one do that? 
just from a a human perspective, when you were speaking, I was thinking about sports. Uh, I love maybe except with the exception of my family, uh, the Toronto Blue Jays more than anything. And as a Blue Jays fan, I am conditioned to abhor the Yankees and the Red Sox. And so everything kind of makes a sense to me. I cheer for my guys. I cheer against their guys. But I think the challenge is, is that when we look at the world that way, it doesn't work. And I I think even from a clinical perspective, I think one of the most profound gifts we have is empathy. And if we can, if we were able to take a step back and say, do I maybe not assume the worst in somebody? Is there a chance that they are more like me than I have considered? And I think in some ways, you know, that that sense of empathy has grown when we think about you know, humanizing diverse people and listening to stories that haven't been heard before. And at the same time, as a person who is a person of color and a woman, it's important for me to listen to people who may be struggling in different ways. You know, I don't want to be too dark, but as a suicide prevention researcher, I know that white middle-aged men um, in rural areas specifically have very high rates of suicidal behavior. And for me to go into those communities and say, well, you know, you have so much privilege. I can't understand where you're coming from. I'm going to focus my time on other marginalized groups. I don't know how that helps them. I don't know how it helps me. And I don't know how it helps invest in the, the other communities that I may be involved in and interested in serving. So I think empathy and trying to find shared human connection and trying to move away from who's right and who's wrong and whose team am I on um, can be very helpful. Right. David, I'm sure you you have something to add to that. That was a, a- a great defense of empathy as as what is needed as connective tissue and the ability in in my case as as like david a uh, older white guy all of us uh, need to listen and give the floor to other people because we've had the floor for a long time and i think part of empathy comes from listening as a psychiatrist both for Javeria and myself this is our uh, main technical skill we don't operate Right. Uh, We don't put casts on people, but we use our ears pretty aggressively. And the other reality is that by the nature of our work, we're exposed very often to a wide array of people whose experiences, whose lives, uh, whose cultures are very different than our own. And so if you have that essential curiosity about the other, that helps you uh, overcome some of the narrow casting of your own uh, information experience. The challenge now is that there is indeed such a deluge of information that's omni-available that we are uh, increasingly compelled to rely on aggregators of our information. And we're most likely to pick aggregators that are consistent with our own worldview. So that's that continuous reinforcement. And so I always think it's good when newspapers that I read have a often a token columnist from a different perspective than the zeitgeist of the newspaper to uh, open my ears and eyes a bit. Yeah, Javeria, where do you consume your news as a millennial? What institution do you trust to provide the truth about uh, about such things? That's a great question. I was reflecting um, with my husband the other day that as we've lost our long commutes, we read fewer paper books, which is such a, a physical loss. Um, so it was really important to us that we continue to receive the newspaper uh, because it's, you know, the medium is the message to hold on and to be able to consume and to read the words and to be challenged to read words in opposition to what you may believe in or what you may hold true. I remember um, when I was, it was younger, it was really important for us to to subscribe to magazines that we didn't really necessarily agree with. So for a long time, we had a New Republic subscription. Um, we had a, an Economist subscription, which, you know, I certainly wouldn't have called myself a centrist at that time. But um, I think it's really important to, to consume media in different ways. But you're exactly right. As a elderly millennial, a lot of my news comes from Twitter and it comes in twit hit quick hits and it comes from people I agree with. And there's a culture, I think, of wanting to, in the expression, to dunk on someone, to say the exact right quip. And before it might have been, you know, me insulting a colleague in David's office and us both having a laugh about it. But now you can do that really publicly. And then there's immediate reinforcement with the likes and the retweets. But I think it, in some ways it does rob us of our humanity. Um, and I 
I was thinking about some women um, scientists I know who are extraordinary communicators with respect to COVID. And one of them said to me recently, like, I can't keep up with these guys who are tweeting, you know, 20 times, 30 times an hour or a day. And if I want to take the time to be considered or measured or talk to a media outlet, I want to prepare. And I just don't have the time to do that. And so I think that sometimes paradoxically, in spite of the deluge of information, the voices that are most confident and maybe less least prone to self-reflection are the ones that uh, are the dominant discourse. So you have to look, I think. By the way, Rick, I'm, I'm not on Twitter. I've never been on Twitter. <laughs> and I've had friends of various ages, people older than me, as well as people younger than me, trying to convince me why I should be on Twitter. And so then I occasionally take a look to see what these people have tweeted. And I think, no, I, I don't need this. And I, I I can think of a million things I'd rather be doing than tweeting that um, bring me pleasure and peace and knowledge. Well, you're going to be no help at all promoting this podcast. That's for sure. <laughs> That's correct. I, what if I write a letter with my fountain pen here and and tell my friends about it? Let's and mail it to my followers and then we'll, we'll really, really uh, break new records. <laughs> Social media. Some of us, like David, avoid it completely and live meaningful, purposeful lives. Others dabble, using it for distraction, information, or promotion of, say, a podcast. Others are addicted because social media platforms were designed to be addictive. Many founders and former employees of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, etc. have come out saying how dangerous and destructive social media has become, like a digital Frankenstein monster. But it's not the monster we need to fear, it's the monstrous, addictive things it can bring out in us. Tribalism, radicalism, nationalism. These isms can rip apart societies, communities, and families, even our own fragile identities. On the negative side, we are in the midst of a mental health crisis in our society. It precedes the pandemic. The pandemic has not helped things. Uh, according to the CAMH website, it's the number one cause of disability in the world. On the plus side, we're also talking about mental health more than we ever have. And the stigma around mental health seems to be diminishing. And I feel there's a generational influence here where young people are pulling the conversation forward where it needs to go and shaking some of the old crusty preconceptions and stereotypes. Duveria, am, am I correct in that assumption? Yeah, I, I, you know, I have two daughters uh, who are eight and four. And so we think about this all the time as a family and, and, they know that their mother is a doctor for feelings. And so we talk about our feelings quite a lot in this household, but more than just in the house, I know that when they go to school, the first thing they do is talk about what color the zone they are in. Am I green? Am I feeling calm and reflective and eager to learn? Am I blue or sad or tired? Am I yellow, anxious or overwhelmed or nervous? And, you know, as someone who is approaching 40, I never had these conversations as a young person. I think sometimes generationally, there's this idea that young people younger than us are special snowflakes. So for for David, maybe that's me, and for me, that's maybe my you know brother and sister who are in their late twenties. You know, there's always a, a generation below who are too sensitive. But I, I really like how you put that, Rick. It's the idea that young people are talking about mental illness, they're raising awareness, they're getting care that they need, and we know that some of the highest rates of distress and disability are in middle aged and older people. And so, if they can pull us along on that journey, I think it's really meaningful and important. You know, one of the stereotypes you made me think of was that in television, if they ever want to show that a kid is messed up, their parents are psychotherapists or psychologists. <laughs> Just saying. We, my husband's an engineer, so it really balances us out, I hope. You'll be fine. I can just tell by the way you seem to speak to your kids. They're going to have a lot going for them. Uh, David, over to you. Uh, younger people versus older people and views around mental health. Oh, it's way better. Way better, Rick. I mean, and this is not an accident. This is the concerted effort of tons of people to try to make this conversation more explicit. It's also based on the recognition that our young people uh, is where we find the onset of about 75 percent of adult forms of mental illness. So if you intervene earlier, if you open up the conversation earlier, hopefully it's going to lead 
to better outcomes. So uh, I really take my hat off to all of the people who've championed the fight to get this conversation out in the open. I mean, we're recording this the day after Bell Let's Talk, which has become internationally known for not simply raising unprecedented amounts of money for the cause of mental health, but also for opening up conversations across the country. Now, it can't be one day out of 365, but nevertheless, it's, I think, uh, had a catalytic contribution to a changing conversation over the last 12 years. Interesting you mentioned that because there was a tweet uh, that I liked yesterday that said, talking about mental health on social media is like having an AA meeting in a bar. And I don't know why I liked it. It was that kind of clever thing that you tend to like. And then I thought, actually, that's not really fair. I, I just, I, I think you can be cynical about corporations, but I always feel that uh, it's better they're doing that than other things. And I really do feel that social media can help us communicate about mental health. So Javeria, as a, as a master of technology, being a millennial, I'm stereotyping you, what role do you feel technology can play? We know the bad side. We know the dark side. We know that young people consume too much media and it raises their level of anxiety, et cetera. What about the good side? Last night, I was reading a book to my daughters, um, and it was a Thomas the Tank Engine book picked by the littler one, of course. And uh, they were talking about steam trains and how revolutionary it was to have that form of transportation and then electric trains and then, um, you know, air travel. Like I when I think about technology or social media in general, I, you know, we can it can we can do a value laden sort of thought on it, or we can say it's it's going to be the air that we breathe and the water that we swim in. And that's why I really like David's comments earlier. I think we can all make decisions based on our, our values. And I think anytime any kind of behavior is compulsive, um, you know, if you're going to that bar because you need to go to that bar, if you're clicking on Twitter, on opening your Twitter account because you need to do it because you're avoiding other things that cause you pain, or if you don't do it, you feel awful. Like that's the problem maybe rather than the, the intervention itself. So you haven't seen David's TikTok account. It has a hundred million followers. <laughs> now that is that is something I would like and subscribe to. Absolutely. <laughs> First days of the pandemic, my, uh, at that time, 14 year old daughter, she was on TikTok all the time doing dances because there's lots of places where you can do different things. There are actually great political speeches on TikTok too, but she was in the dancing mode. And so for a hundred nights in a row, we recorded a hundred TikToks of dad and daughter trying to not embarrass myself. And you've seen me on stage embarrass myself. I have no problem doing that, uh, David, but Sorry. this was something else. And I love that so much because it brought you together. It was something that you did together and that you could share with people that you love. And I think yeah. that's so beautiful and very different than, than some other ways of consuming or engaging with social media, for sure. Uh, Cam H had a, a campaign called Apart, Not Alone, uh, reflecting the fact that uh, too many people use the term social distance when uh, that's not what we need. We needed physical distance and social proximity. And technology has enabled that. And we've got to be very grateful for people who were able to connect with grandchildren on FaceTime or whatever versus being cooped up and not seeing them. So like all of these things, it is a double-edged sword. Double-edged sword. It means that something cuts both ways as opposed to being just beneficial or just a liability. Western culture seems to favor either or rather than both and. And one clear example of that is how we view the brain itself. Pop psychology has told us that the left side of our brain is smart and organized, and the right side of our brain is creative and flighty and pretty much useless to modern industrial society. But there's growing neuropsychiatric research showing us that everything we need to bridge gaps in our society, empathy, compassion, humor, holistic, both and kind of thinking, these all have their primary home in the right hemisphere. If I was designing a new sports helmet, 
it would just have protection right over here in front of the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex because it's a region of the brain where everything that's important seems to get integrated and made sense of. And you read lots and lots of scientific literature and it always seems to be that all roads lead to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Going back to our uh, neuropsychiatric training, I think so. I, one of the things that was that what I was thinking when, as you and David were both speaking is around how explanatory models are so important for humans, that it's really important for us to be able to kind of tell a story that makes sense and that feels good and represents our values. And I was thinking a little bit about yesterday about Bell Let's Talk Day and how one way of dichotomizing mental health or mental illness or mental wellness is it's well it's all social determinants of health or it's all brain health and we know that like there's a, a vast amount of literature around how social determinants of health can modify the brain through epigenetics how do we like move beyond one versus the other to integration and understanding complexity it's the interactive nature of this the exquisitely interactive nature the example i often give to people is the phenomenon of human embarrassment. And let me give you the example, and this will make sense to you, Rick. You walk out on stage, there's a thousand people in the audience, and you realize you forgot to put your pants on. Again? And of course, if you were at home without your pants on, it would be of no consequence if you were alone. But in front of an audience of a thousand strangers, it is a social determinant of your immediate health. And what happens is in less than one second, that entirely social construct of embarrassment translates into an intense psychological and physiological experience. Suddenly there are rivulets of sweat at your temples. You feel your kneecaps bobbing up and down and your mind is racing with a series of catastrophic consequences. And so to me, that integrates biology, psychology, and the social environment in a nanosecond. Nature and nurture merge together very quickly, don't they? And look, the three of us are parents, right? Yes. And the old saw is that uh, people who have their first child believe profoundly in nurture. They believe that everything they do is going to intimately shape the nature of that child. And then they have a second child and they discover nature. Well, let's discover your true nature and maybe embarrass you at the same time in a game show. I'm going to begin with a series of quotes, and I need you as experts in the field to tell me if this was Sigmund Freud or Carl Jung. David, most people do not really want freedom because freedom involves responsibility, and most people are frightened of responsibility. David, Freud or Jung? Freud. Correct. Juveria, this one's for you. Okay. I am not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. Jung. Correct. David, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. Freud. Eh. Jung. Juveria. Unexpressed emotions will never die. They are buried alive and will come forth later in uglier ways. Freud. Correct. David. The pendulum of the mind oscillates between the sense and nonsense, not between right and wrong. Sounds like Sergeant Schultz on Hogan's Heroes. <laughs> I know nothing, nothing. <laughs> Who is it? Young. Young, correct. And last one, Juveria. Knowing your own darkness is the best method for dealing with the darknesses of other people. I'm going to say young. Correct. Wow. Okay, we're moving on. David, some boomer questions. In Peanuts, Charlie Brown, Lucy runs a psychiatry booth. How much does she charge per visit? Five cents. Correct. And bonus points, Juveria, what little sign does she flip when she arrives at her booth? Is in. Doctor is in. Very good. You each get a point there. David, which Black Sabbath song refers to a personality disorder, quote, characterized by pervasive and longstanding suspiciousness and generalized mistrust of others, unquote? 
Since I really have no idea who Black Sabbath is or what their music is. Javeria? I don't know. Ozzy Osbourne was the singer of Black Sabbath, and that song is called Paranoid. Okay. David, name three songs with the word crazy in the title. Crazy for you. Okay. Gee. These are pop songs? Any song. I'm opening the door wide. Uh, that's not helping me, that opening door. Okay, Javeria, I'm opening the door for you, and don't Google. Okay, so I will say Crazy in Love. Mm-hmm. Beyonce and Jay-Z. And I will say Bracket, You Drive Me, Bracket, Crazy, Britney Spears. Do you have a third one? Uh, Crazy for You by Madonna. Wow, we got into Madonna. Another music question. I'm going to pull up my guitar here. So this is um, more of a Gen X kind of thing. Name the song or the band. that for? Uh, that's that for, for David. Oh. Uh, no, that's for Javeria, no apparently. <laughs> that is Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana. Uh, Nirvana. Yay. Okay, good. Uh, I, who? Nirvana. Nirvana. David, come on, you gotta know this. This is like one of the biggest songs from the last few years. I'm gonna take my horse to the old town road. I'm gonna ride till I can no more. You know, it's very catchy and I'm hearing it for the first <laughs> time in my life, uh, so I I can't tell you what it is. Javeria, easy one. Yeah, it's one of my daughter's favorites. And I think a TikTok favorite too. That's Little Nas, Lil Nas X. I Correct, think. David, 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 and and Billy Ray Cyrus. You might have heard that name from way back. Billy Ray Cyrus, David. No. Wait a second. That's the father of Miley Cyrus, right? <laughs> oh, that. I'm going to give you a point just for knowing okay. that. Okay. And he has a mullet. He, I believe he did have a mullet. I don't know. I hope he still doesn't have a mullet. But he had a song called, David, his famous song. Achy, Breaky Heart. There. Boy, I'm, I'm giving you an extra, extra point for just eating that up. Uh, this has got to be for you, David. Famous TV show, Buffy the... Vampire Slayer. Mighty Morphin. Power Rangers. Teenage Mutant. Ninja Turtles. Juveria. Who can turn the world on with a smile? It's Mary Tyler Moore. Wow, how do you know that one? I don't know how to do a lot of things I should know how to do, but I know a lot of things that don't matter. Here's a bonus point. There was a spinoff, a very famous character from that show. Oh, Rhoda. Yes. Name the Flintstones. Fred, Wilma, and Pebbles. Which TV sitcom featured a famous psychotherapist living with a snobby brother, Niles, and his grumpy blue-collar dad who loved baseball? Frasier. Name any line from Shakespeare, Juveria. Um, to be or not to be. That is Good. the question. Yes, from Hamlet. Uh, David, who said this? Oh, where do I get that wabbit? What would you want with a wabbit? That would be the late, great Elmer Fudd. Who's the other character? Bugs. Juveri, who said this? Space, the final frontier. Um, Captain Kirk? Yes, James T. Kirk. Uh, William Shatner. Uh, what classic movie is this for Juveria? Ma Mary! Well, hello, Mr. Bank Examiner. Mr. Bailey, there's a deficit. I know, $8,000. George, I have a little paper here. Well, I'll bet it's a warrant for my arrest. Isn't that wonderful? I'm going to jail. Where's Mary? Is it? That's Jimmy Stewart. Is it It's a Wonderful Life? Ding, ding, ding. Yes. David, who said this? An iron curtain has descended across the continent. Winston Churchill. Javeri, who said this? Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Ronald Reagan. Javeri, who said this? To put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. I'm going to say JFK. Yeah, okay. Which celestial body was this song about? This is open to anyone. Bomba ba bomb ba bomb ba bomb ba bomb ba ba bomb ba bomb ba dang a dang dang a dig a dong ding blue. Moon. David gets the point. You were both terrific sports. I don't know who won. We'll find out later, but I wanted to thank you both. Javeria, David, you've been amazing guests. Hope this wasn't too painful. This was a blast. Thank you, Rick. It was wonderful. Thanks so much for having us on. And I'll send you the link and David won't share it. <laughs>
I hope you share it, friends, because that's how a podcast finds its audience. Word of mouth from supporters like you. So thank you for listening. And of course, thank you to my guests, Drs. David Goldblum and Javeria Zahir. My name's Rick Miller, and I wrote, recorded, and edited this episode with multimedia by my team at Kidoons. For more info about the Boom Trilogy and our many other projects, visit kidoons.com or boomtheshow.com. Thanks also to my partners on this podcast, Leap, an online community where life experience meets innovation, created by Cabby, the Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation. For more info or to become a Leap member, visit cabby.com slash leap. If you're on a podcast player, please follow us, write a review, and tell someone about this or other episodes you liked. You can also send any questions, comments, feedback to me at Rick Miller Actor on Twitter or Instagram or rick at rickmiller.ca by email. And hey, in a polarized world, you have a choice. Build a wall or build a bridge. Build bridges, not walls. Xing the gap.